Schofield note should be sufficient. Page number 100 in the Schofield reference edition. How many, of you have, how many of you have ever owned a Schofield reference box? Raise your hand. You know Schofield was divorced and remarried? But for you to talk about, like Mr. Schofield did, that there was one day a dispensation of the law and now a dispensation of grace. That irks the fire out of my Baptist brain. Hi, my name is Joe Major. I'm the pastor of Faith Baptist Church in Violet, Louisiana. And one thing that was always in my home, as well as in the churches that I grew up in, was the Schofield Reference Bible. And this Bible, more than any other book, was influential in the lives of Christians throughout my lifetime. And this book here, I want to ask you a question. Was, have you ever read what is in this book? Have you seen the notes that are in it? Was this man a good man, a godly man, a man that could be looked up to? And if so, why was it that he left his wife and daughters here in Kansas and completely abandoned them, never gave them a dime in support? The Bible tells us that if a man provide not for his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. So this man, again, was he a great man that was used by God? Or was this man an agent of the devil? Before we get into the doctrine, I want to talk about who Cyrus Schofield was, because this is going to blow away people. If you have a Schofield reference Bible, uh, you need to know the author of that reference Bible, because he's not the person you think he is. He's not Dr. Schofield. He never was a doctor. Theater. He never was a doctor, all right? Never, ever. You know, Schofield survived 18 major Civil War battles. God brought him through to give you a book that was that helpful all through those many, many decades. He was even at the Battle of Antietam and God pulled him through that, the bloodiest battle in that one day casualty count in the history of the American military. 20 something thousand casualties in one day. The man who put that book together for you was that battlefield. Embellished his Civil War record. He was in the uh, Confederate Army, the 7th uh, Tennessee Infantry. Uh, he totally embellished his his uh, record and uh, if you if you just go on the internet you can find a, a, a very detailed uh, s investigation by a Tennessee professor who did a lot of research into Schofield's true military record and that was a contemporary of his age yes. too that wrote, that wrote yes. that up and so who wrote exactly what Schofield did but then compared it to what he said about his record he embellished it he, he, he made up stuff. He, he made people believe he was a hero. He was a hero at Antietam. I mean, all kinds of stuff. And, and Schofield just made things up. But this, is, this was typical of his life. Using the alias of Charles Ingersoll, he had, uh, on more than one occasion, spent some time in jail. David Lutzweiler documents a few of these in, uh, in his uh, of this is dishonest life. In November 29, 1877, edition of the Milwaukee Daily Sentinel reported, this was in the newspaper, a fellow named Charles Ingersoll, who for two weeks past boarded at the Metropolitan Hotel, is under arrest for vagrancy. The fellow pretended to be the owner of a 1,300-acre plantation near Mobile and was paving the way to a union with a fair daughter of the South Side. when his career uh, here was suddenly brought to a close by the landlord of the hotel, Mr. Sam Maynard, who cared more to save the lady than to call him to account for the amount of the board bill. Well, I should say Senator uh, Ingalls appointed uh, Schofield uh, as the U.S. District Attorney for Kansas. Right. Okay. Schofield was 29 years old. Nice position for 29. He had never went to law school. Right. Okay. Became U.S. District Attorney for the state of, or, you know, for Kansas at age 29. He didn't last one year in, in that office. He was forced to resign. Well, listen to me, folks. Cyrus Schofield was forced to resign as U.S. District Attorney of Kansas under a cloud of scandal, including bribery. Yes, and land transfers and yes, yes and very questionable practices. He embezzled practices. money out of people. There were warrants for his arrest. Some people believe he served some, some time in jail for forgery. Uh, he was forging his 
forging names to, to bank notes to get loans. I mean, the guy was in, involved in all kinds of shady deals, okay? This is Cyrus Schofield. Now, in 1882, after his alleged conversion, listen carefully, after his conversion in jail, he continued to neglect his own wife and children back in Kansas, while at the same time serving as the fill-in pastor of the First Congregational Church of Dallas, Texas. And he ends up in Dallas, Texas, and becomes the pastor of the First Congregational Church of Dallas. Now, he marries a woman from the church, but he doesn't tell the church that he abandoned his wife right. and children back in in Kansas. Kansas. Now, he never gave them a dime in support, totally abandoned them, and yet he's a pastor of a church in Dallas, okay? And he doesn't tell the congregation. You know, he, he didn't put that on his resume. He didn't tell the, uh, you know, the pastoral selection committee, oh, by the way, uh, I've got another wife and kids back there in Kansas, and right. I got this new wife here, and he just kept it quiet, okay? Schofield was not qualified to pastor a church of any kind. For one, he was known as being a crooked lawyer, that was one of his, that was his reputation. You know, he was considered a very successful U.S. District Attorney, but he was forced to resign because of scandal. He was accused of taking bribes of, from the railroad and political contributions and things like that. And, you know, the rec records don't make it clear, but some people believe too, he even did some jail time. So we see also that Schofield, he abandoned his first wife and his two daughters. He gets invited to become a member of the Lotus Club of New York City. Now, what's the Lotus Club? Well, the Lotus Club is uh, one of the most prestigious uh, gentlemen's club of New York City. Uh, we're talking about people's you know, sponsors like uh, Andrew Carnegie, okay? Right. Uh, the, the elite of the elite were members of the Lotus Club, and it's still around today. Uh, where did he get the money? Where did he get the money to pay the membership dues? The membership dues were more than his salary. Right. All right? Where? Why would, why would he be invited, this nobody pastor, why would he be invited to come to New York City and join the Lotus Club? Well, who, who sponsored him? Who, the man who sponsored Cyrus Schofield was a Jewish lawyer named Samuel uh, Untenmeyer. Now, Samuel Untenmeyer was a agent for the Rothschild banking dynasty. All right, so he's the one that's financing this up to this point. Well, he's inviting Cyrus Schofield to join the Lotus Club. Why? Okay. What, why would a lawyer, Samuel Untemeyer, an agent for the Rothschilds, what interest would he have in Cyrus Schofield, an unknown, undistinguished pastor of a small church in Massachusetts who's got a police record and a shady past for being a swindler? Why would this Jewish lawyer want anything to do with Cyrus Schofield. Why is a Zionist Jewish lawyer interested in some small town preacher in Boston? Well, that's and the, working with isn't him? that the million dollar question here? And there's one, one other piece of information you need to know about Mr. Untemeyer. He is, remember I told you, he was an agent for the Rothschilds. He wrote the Senate law. He wrote the Senate bill that became law that established the U.S. Federal Reserve banking system. So this is the guy that we have to blame for the Federal Reserve yes. today? He also became the, I guess, the first lawyer for the IRS. Well, Cyrus Schofield suddenly gets sponsored to go to London, and he has a meeting with the head people, the top executives of Oxford Publishing. All right, and that was the premier publishing uh, company in the world at that time, you right? You better believe it. And you just couldn't get a meeting in London with Oxford Publishing. But he could. Yeah, he got him there and he got him over to, he got him over to London to meet with the Oxford Publishing executives. And so Schofield comes back with a contract, a publishing contract to publish John Nelson Darby's Zionist notes in a Christian Bible. This book was so important that Oxford University Press opened its first branch in the United States to publish it. They had never published an American book before. They had not published Whittier's books, his poetry. They had not published Longfellow. They had not published any of our great American authors, but they published this. 
The Schofield Reference Bible was copyrighted in 1909. It is an Old and New Testament with most of the notes in the original text added in the Old Testament. Later, many notes were added to the New Testament as the Schofield Reference Bible was re-edited several times with the most radical change being made in 1967. The book has been updated over and over again, each time by Oxford University Press, uh, always having uh, Mr. Schofield's name on the front of it. In fact, he's listed as the editor in the most recent edition, even though he's been dead for about 40 years. Listen, all of these churches, I mean, most pre-tribbers, and at least in the independent Baptist world, they at least claim to be King James only. But you know what? Schofield was not King James only. Now, he was born in 1843, he died in 1921. This guy was a criminal and a deceiver, and he popularized the writings of John Nelson Darby with the publication of the Schofield Reference Bible. Now, this publication was originally supposed to be published using the revised version, the 1884 Catholic Bible. But the Oxford publishers, which obviously had a Masonic and a, a Jewish influence because they were trying to create through the Balfour Declaration, they were trying to establish Israel as a nation again. They, they said, no, 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 let's, let's use the authorized version. Let's use the King James Version so we'll have more widespread acceptance. If they'll accept it for which Bible version it is, then maybe they'll look at your footnotes and begin to trust it. Because many of his footnotes were simply expounding on what Darby had started. The footnotes change the Bible meaning completely in a lot of different passages. All you have to do is turn to page one and you find heresy. Schofield was not a King James preacher. First of all, he felt that there were errors uh, in the Texas Receptives. Right in the introduction, of Schofield's notes right there in the very beginning, he says this. He says, after mature reflection, it was determined to use the authorized version. None of the many revisions have commended themselves to the people at large. The revised version, which now has been before the public for 27 years, gives no indication of becoming in any general sense the people's Bible of the English-speaking world. Translation, the reason why he used the King James Bible to give his notes is because it was popular. Not because it was the Bible that he believed in, not because he believed it was the perfect Word of God, but because it was the popular Bible. And whatever po Bible it was that was popular, had it been the revised version, he would have used the revised version. That's what he just said there. Now he goes on to say this. He says as well, he says right there, the discovery of the Sinaiticic manuscript and the laborers in the field of textual criticism of such scholars as Griesbach, Lackman, Tischendorf, Trajales, Weiner, Alf Alford, and listen to these last two names, Westcott and Hort. And we see too that he would refer to men like Westcott and Hort, who he felt had corrected uh, these errors that were in the Texas Receptus. So I don't know how you can be King James when you think that the Texas Receptus has flaws in it. So there's no doubt with his approval of West Cotton Hort that he was not a King James only person. In fact, you go to any independent Baptist church that's worth its salt, and you ask them who West Cotton and Hort were, and ask them if they were godly men, and what will they tell you? They'll tell you no, they were ungodly men, that they perverted the word of God. But this is what Schofield says about these men. West Cotton and Hort have cleared the Greek Textus Receptus of minor inaccuracies. No IFB preacher today would recommend Westcott and Hort in any way, shape, or form. Everyone knows they were enemies of the Word of God. They were enemies of the King James Bible. They were very influential in bringing about all the other versions that's absolutely destroyed doctrine in churches today. Hort wrote, the fact is, I do not see how God's justice can be satisfied without every man suffering in his own person the full penalty for all of his sins. The question comes up, sh should these folks be trusted? Interestingly enough, Hort's son wrote about the attitude of his grandmother towards his father. 
And he wrote this. Circumstances had made her an adherent of the evangelical school, and she was to a certain degree hampered by it. The Oxford movement filled her with dread and anxiety as to its possible effect on her son. She was unable to enter into his theological views, which to her school and generation seemed a desertion of the ancient ways. Thus, pathetically enough, there came to be a barrier between mother and son. He said, grandson said, she was evangelical. So she could not accept her son's views and it created a lifetime barrier between them because she was, you know, one of those old fashioned evangelicals that couldn't accept all the things that her son stood for, like evolution and Christian socialism and universalism and communion of saints. Should they influence millions? Ask Hort's mom. And if you go to any independent Baptist church and you start talking about Westcott and Hort, they'll tell you, hey, that's a reason for us not to use these other versions. Well, don't you think that's a reason for us not to use Schofield's notes? And if it's wrong at the, at the very foundation, it's going to be wrong throughout the rest of it. So Schofield in his notes references the Sinaitic manuscript many times. In fact, for example, in Mark chapter number 16, in the, uh, in the notes, he says this, the passage from verse 9 to the end is not found in the two most ancient manuscripts, the Sinaitic and Vatican, and others have it with partial omissions and variations. And so in many places throughout his notes, he references the Sinaitic and Vatican manuscripts as being the best manuscripts, the most ancient manuscripts. He says, while confirming in a remarkable degree the general accuracy of the authorized version of that text, such emendations of the text as scholarship demands have been placed in the margins of this edition. Now what did he just say? Translation, where the Bible needed to be corrected, he didn't change the scripture, the passage, he placed it in the margins for people to read to cause them to have doubt in the Word of God. Well, Schofield did in fact change the Word of God. Maybe in the actual text that you're reading you won't see any changes, but in the notes he would clearly reference some of these verses as mistakes and show where it should be different. For example, in a very key passage about that proves the timing of the rapture in 2 Thessalonians 2, it says in verse 2, chapter 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Well, if you look in his notes at the beginning of the book, he says the theme of 2 Thessalonians is unfortunately obscured by a mistranslation in the AV of chapter 2 verse 2 where the day of Christ is at hand should be the day of the Lord is now present. Matthew chapter number 17 and verse number 21 and the Bible says this in Matthew 17 verse number 21 and it says how be it this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Now what kind is it talking about there? Now we don't have time to look at the entire story here this, this afternoon, but it's talking about a certain kind of devil that was to be cast out of people. And this verse right here, this is what Schofield says. If you want to see it, it's highlighted in the center reference column. If you want to come up and see it sometime. And it says the two best manuscripts omit verse 21. So what are they saying? Well, we're just going to put in the column every time the King James is wrong. We're going to use the KJV because it's most popular, but then we're going to keep telling you it's wrong over and over again. Like, for example, how about in 1 John 5, 7, when the note in the Schofield Reference Bible, and you say, well, what's 1 John 5, 7? The Bible says, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Here's what it says in the Schofield Reference Bible. It says, it is generally agreed that verse 7 has no real authority and has been inserted. Matthew 23, verse number 14, the Bible says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Now, why do you think Schofield wanted to take this one out of there? 
Maybe because Schofield is going to receive the greater damnation. Because in his notes here, he says again, the best manuscripts omit verse 14. That it ought to be taken out of there is what he says. Listen, this man was a devil uh, from the very beginning. And this man is burning in hell because he not only placed these changes here, but then in other places, he changes the word of God and what the Bible says. Page number 100 in the Schofield Reference Edition of Bible. Coming to Genesis chapter number 2 there, and I want to pick up a passage in an old Schofield. It'll be on the right-hand page. It'll be on the, uh, the right-hand corner, I believe. The Schofield note should be sufficient. How many, of you, how many of you have ever owned a Schofield Reference Bible? Raise your hand. You know Schofield was divorced and remarried? He started the Philadelphia College of the Bible. That's the first Bible college I ever attended. Right, and even if you don't use a Schofield Bible or reference Bible, it has so influenced the leadership of, of so many denominations, you know, like uh, Moody Bible Institute, Dallas Theological Seminary, all these different places. It, that's the template that has been laid on the doctrine in North America. Well, um, Cyrus Schofield was friends with uh, Dwight Moody. Mm -hmm. Now, they, they split. Right. Uh, apparently, Dwight Moody figured out that uh, Cyrus Schofield was shady, but Moody kept the doctrine. Right. Okay. Uh, the uh, Schofield people are the ones who started the Dallas Theological Seminary. Absolutely. 15,773 DTS alumni serve in 101 countries worldwide. Our graduates are heard on the airwaves of Christian radio, over Christian television, and through online distribution. If you've heard any of these programs, you've heard the influencing voice of a DTS graduate. Tony Evans, The Alternative. Chip Ingram, Living on the Edge. David Jeremiah's Turning Point. Erwin Lutzer's Moody Church Hour, or Running to Win. J. Vernon McGee, Through the Bible Radio. Ron Moore, Back to the Bible. Dennis Rainey, Family Life Today. Chuck Swindoll, Insight for Living. Robert Jeffress, Pathway to Victory. All of these ministries have a common thread. They all have people within who are trained by the world-renowned scholars at DTS. The cover shows the editor, Cyrus I. Schofield, with seven other men on the editorial board. One of these was Reverend James M. Gray, president of the Moody Bible Institute, one of the most influential organizations in evangelical circles of the day. There were also two other seminary leaders on the editorial board. Those lending their names were predominantly heads of seminaries and Christian colleges. What happened is the distribution took place through these seminaries. And then when young pastors were graduated from these schools and they went back out and took a church and started to, to teach from the pulpit, they had one of these in their hands. This is what was given to them. And I suppose that they were probably given to the seminaries. It was likely that the Oxford Press made it was very generous in making sure that all these people had these. When did it come together? It came together uh, in the early 1900s because John Nelson Darby's crazy doctrines went nowhere. They stayed in Great Britain among the Plymouth Brethren all through the 1800s. And there were uh, only pockets of people in the United States who even knew about it, that, that gave it any kind of, uh, of respect. But then there was uh, Cyrus Schofield, and Schofield became the the, the propaganda meister for John Nelson Darby's uh, doctrine. Now the first guy we're going to look at is John Nelson Darby and he actually, well, there's a lot of things he did. Let me give you a brief summary. He was born in 1800, died in 1882. He was a lawyer um, and then he became an An Anglican Bible teacher. Now Anglican simply means they came English, the word Anglo-Saxons became English. We speak the English language, it used to be the Anglos. But all that, being in England in religion means you came from the Church of England, which is a Protestant movement It came out of Roman Catholicism. So he had all these Catholic doctrines, 
and it's evident in his writings if you look at what he teaches. He was the founder of what he called the Exclusive Brethren. He created his own little cult, basically. It was very exclusive. They had a lot of secrets. And even the brethren in later days had great arguments with him about the things he began to teach. Now, he's considered to be the father, the father of modern dispensationalism. And I don't know if you know this, Doc, but inside the Plymouth Brethren, there was a, a, a super radical sect all right, called the Exclusive Brethren. Okay. All right. And so they were even more privileged than the regular brethren. Not first I've heard of that. Yeah. So John Nelson Darby was the founder of the exclusive brethren. Okay. All right. He had even more knowledge than the rest of them. And so they came up with this over time they came up with this this doctrine of dispensationalism that God was dealing with humanity in dispensations. So this idea of dispensationalism that God operated with man in different ways in different ages, had different redemptive paths yes. throughout the ages. Nowhere is that taught in scripture. Now, Schofield taught what we call today hyper-dispensationalism. And in fact, in his notes, he said that Israel at Mount Sinai rashly exchanged grace for the law. And so thereby, the way of salvation changed. And from that point on, he taught that salvation throughout the rest of the Old Testament was by works and not by faith alone. And so continually throughout his notes, he teaches hyper dispensationalism that the way of salvation changes from age to age. But back in Galatians chapter number three, this chapter is a chapter that destroys dispensationalism because dispensationalism basically teaches this that throughout the ages and throughout history that the way of salvation has changed that throughout each successive age that would come that basically God's plan of salvation failed in every age and therefore God had to come up with a new plan and for each dispensation there's a different way of salvation that people were saved in many different ways. Dispensational salvation is clearly a false doctrine and a very dangerous false doctrine. For one, it's very clear in the Bible that salvation has always been by grace through faith. It's very clear in the New Testament that Abraham was justified by faith without works. So right there, that proves even in the Old Testament, salvation was by faith. David said, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And through it, you have example after example of verses in the Old Testament that clearly show salvation was by faith. But even in the New Testament, it will often reference examples in the Old Testament to prove that salvation is by faith. Now, if dispensational salvation were true, then why would someone in the New Testament dispensation be using Old Testament examples to prove a salvation by faith without works? It's very clear in the New Testament that many of the Jews struggled with the idea of a salvation without works. And they would often go to the Old Testament to prove that salvation was by faith without works. Now look at Galatians chapter number three and let's just see if the way of salvation, if it ever changed throughout the ages. Look at what the Bible says down in verse number 21 and the Bible says that there is the law then against the promises of God. God forbid, for if, Hey, that English language, it'll trip you up, won't it? Look at what it says there. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. Hey, what is the Bible saying? But the Bible saying that, hey, if salvation, if there could have been a law given, that that is the way that salvation should have always been that that would have been the way that we would have been saved if we could just be saved by keeping the law, by being good enough, by keeping the commandments, by keeping the sacrifices, by doing the Passover, by being circumcised, by doing all those things that were in the law, then that is the way that salvation should have remained. 
But guess what? Sal salvation could never be by the law. And that's why the Bible says in the very next verse, verse number 22, But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that what? That believe, the Bible says. You see, salvation has always been by faith. It's always been by belief. And this one passage right there proves that. Hebrews chapter number 11 is another passage that destroys dispensationalism because in Hebrews chapter number 11, in the very beginning, it says these obtained a good report through faith. And in the very end, after it's talked about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and David and Jephthah and Barak and Samson, it says, and these all obtained a good report through faith. Every one of them. Hey, those are men that spanned many different so-called ages. I mean, they went through many so-called dispensations, and yet every one of them obtained a good report, the Bible says, through faith. The basic element of modern dispensationalism, and that which gave the movement its name, is the belief that human history is divided into well-defined periods, or dispensations, in which God relates to man in different ways according to the classical definition of C.I. Schofield, one of the movement's leading theologians. A dispensation is a period of time during which man is tested in respect to obedience to some specific revelation of the will of God. Seven such are distinguished in Scripture. What they're essentially teaching here is works. Yeah. Adam had to do the works. Noah had to build the ark to get saved. And they, David had to do certain things to get saved. And they turned salvation into works in every period of time, except now we happen to be in the, the lucky one, right? Yeah. But yet, God is unchanging. He says, I change not. Yeah. Yeah. The gospel has always been the same. Yeah. In Genesis chapter 4, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. What were they calling for? Salvation right. of the soul, of the spirit, knowing that it was by believing on the Lord. But for you to talk about, like Mr. Schofield did, that there was one day a dispensation of the law and now a dispensation of grace. That irks the fire out of my Baptist brains. I used to sit and hear preachers talk about the dispensation of law and the dispensation of grace. And I had the same idea that you have, many of you. You have the idea, and I had it, that there was a day in the Old Testament when men were saved by keeping the law. But in the New Testament, they're saved by grace. If you didn't have a Schofield Bible or Larkin's charts, you would never in this world come up with any such thing as a dispensation of grace. Bless your little pea-picking, cotton-picking heart. The dispensation of grace started as soon as man fell in the Garden of Eden and will continue until the last man is saved in the millennium. The dispensation of grace always has been, always will be. God's grace did not begin with the coming of Bethlehem. God always was saving people by grace through faith. And the purpose of the law in the Old Testament is the same purpose of the law in the New Testament to show man that he's exceeding sinful and cannot save himself and cause him to get to Jesus in a hurry. Now I said, with the coming of the book of Acts, there was no new gospel. I said, with the coming of the book of Acts, there was no new church. I said, with the coming of the book of Acts, there was no new dispensation. In fact, dispensationalism is, and what it is, is it is a false doctrine that they use to bring in whatever doctrine they want. I mean, that's exactly what it's for, that they can just use it and twist the scriptures around if they want to bring in some kind of weird teaching. Well, it's dispensationalism that allows them to do that. You don't know how long the earth was here. For all I know, the carbon dating might be right. Who knows? Well, what about dinosaurs? What about them? Were they here prior to Adam being here? I don't know, maybe. Were they here as a result of the angels falling and them getting turned into aquatic reptilian beings? I don't know, the devil sure was, turning into a seven-headed red dragon. I don't know, were they here before the earth got knocked out of kilter and got knocked off of his axis and was it as a result of uh, angels uh, breeding not just with women but also breeding with animals? And so basically what they teach is that not only did angels cohabitate with 
uh, with women and there were giants born to them, but then they take it even farther into strange doctrine and teach that those angels then taught man how to mingle his seed with animals and that there's all these hybrids that are born and that's why you have the centaurs which were half man and half goat and you have the unicorns and all this other stuff that they talk about and they just take that doctrine into some really strange doctrine. I don't know, there could be that taking place, there could be some things because there's centaurs and satyrs in your Bible, there's satyrs, there's unicorns in the Bible. Well, a unicorn is really a goat that's very powerful, it's an ox and, and so on and so forth. I never thought of that as a unicorn at all. I think of it a horse with a thing with wings on it. You don't think the Bible's telling you the truth when it says a satyr? What is a satyr? It's a half man, half goat. You say, what is that? That's a combination of human beings and animals. And the Bible says, and God created great whales and every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind. What did the Bible say? After their kind and every winged fowl after his kind and God saw that it was good. Look down to verse 24. The Bible says, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind and it was so. You know what? Everything in this world brings forth after their own kind. It is impossible to mingle the seed of man with an animal and to produce a living thing. You know why? Because God set boundaries back in the very beginning that everything brings forth after its kind. There's this holiest, what the Bible college teachers call the holy of holies. So that's what they put on that paper I studied. Anyway, amen. You get over here in this holiest, what the Bible calls it, it's where God is. You know, that's where the Shekinah glory of God is. There's no light needed here because when God shows up, there'll be light. The only light's here. There's outside light that shines in that outer court from the outside. There's an illuminating light of the Holy Spirit's work in the holy place. But here in this holiest, there's no need for a candle because when God shows up, there'll be a Shekinah. There'll be a light. There'll be a visibility. You'll see all things clearly over here. That word Shekinah or Shekinah is never found in the Bible one time. It's never found in the Hebrew. It's just never been used in the Bible before the time of Christ. But after the Jews rejected the Lord Jesus Christ and had their apostate, rabbinical, uh, Judaism religion that's based on the Babylonian Talmud and not on the Bible, that's where they came up with this concept of Shekinah. And if you go to a Jewish website and look up what they teach about Shekinah, they teach that this is a feminine name for God and that it represents the female aspect of God. And what they teach in Judaism is that God is both male and female. And I asked a, a Jewish rabbi, I said, you know, where in the Bible does it teach that God is both male and female? Because all throughout the Bible it's just he, him, his, he. But they, they say, no, no, no. God is both male and female. And so when we talk about God, sometimes we call him by his name Shekinah. And the Jews say that when they call him by Shekinah, they'll use the word she about God. So tribulation anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Now that smacks in the face of uh, an Anderson crowd again and, and, and anybody. A typical fundamentalist crowd that uh, looks, you know, has the same old hang up about looking forward to the cross, the Old Testament saints, which is the biggest, dumbest bunch of junk you could ever come up with. And a lot of you good folks out there, you just can't keep carrying a Bible around without believing it. Sure. And uh, so in the Old Testament, Gentiles that were looking for God, seeking for immortality, and uh, that's what Romans 1 is all about, about looking up and seeing the God up in heaven. They had no clear revelation of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And uh, that, that's the, uh, they were they were saved by their conscience. And so we're, and, and, but uh, so some folks, uh, I'll, I'll tell you something, it's, I was on an airplane and I was reading Clarence Larkin's Dispensational Charts and he said that that verse could apply even to the heathen today if they have no gospel, the opportunity to hear the truth, but they're looking for it. Now the question comes to mind, what about all these unsaved heathen 
What about these people who've never heard the gospel? When they die, do they really go to hell? What about those in heathen countries where they've never seen a missionary, never seen a Bible, never been handed a gospel tract, never seen a television program or heard a radio broadcast? If they die without Jesus Christ, will they go to hell? And I would like to tell you, no, they'd go to heaven, but since I believe the Bible, I must tell you exactly what the Bible says. And the Bible says, except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You say, but they, they've never heard about Jesus Christ. God would be unfair. God would be unrighteous to let them die and go into hell and burn forever and ever. They're ignorant, and since they're ignorant, they should go to heaven. But the Bible said in Acts 17, verse 30, that God at one time winked at ignorance, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. All men everywhere. That means in China. That means in Russia. That means in the communist countries where no missionaries can go with the gospel. All men everywhere are commanded to repent. And if men went to heaven because they were ignorant, we're going at evangelizing the world the wrong way. The Bible never says, follow your conscience and thou shalt be saved. A conscience cannot be followed unless it's properly educated. The Catholic's conscience bothers him if he doesn't go to Mass. I never have been to Mass, and my conscience doesn't bother me at all. It's the difference in our education. Come on. You must properly educate the conscience. The Bible nowhere says follow your conscience. The light of creation, the light of conscience is not enough. A man cannot go out in the woods or the mountains and, the, and look up and see the, see the mountains and the trees and the sunset and say, I, I believe there must be a God. Go to heaven. He won't go to heaven like that. The Bible never says believe and be saved. The Bible always identifies the object of faith. It is always believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. No clothes mentioned in the first thing. You say, why? They're covered in light, just like the Adam's covered in light. Why? Because the Bible says the devil can appear as an angel of what? I wonder where he learned that. When he appears, he can appear as an angel of light, as ministers and ministers of righteousness. But uh, a debate, sadly, is long-ranged among uh, people who believe the Bible and some who don't believe the Bible as to whether or not there is a what's been termed a gap between Genesis 1 and verse 1 and Genesis 1 and verse 2. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Alright, so would you agree that's in the beginning? Alright, now the second verse. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now the question becomes this, did something happen between 1-1 one, one and 1-2? One, this is what Ruckman says, Genesis 1-1 one, one refers to a date much earlier, maybe millions of years. Nobody knows the exact time of the original creation of the world in verse 1. Genesis 1-2 one, is not the original creation because 2 Peter 5-6 three, three, tells us something happened to the original creation. Genesis 1-2 says something terrible happened, a great calamity of some kind, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. This is undoubtedly connected with the events of Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, but fundamentalists who write apologetic literature about the flood have all rejected 2 Peter 3 as referring to Genesis 1-2, which of course it does. So the moderate apostate fundamentalist is just as heretical as a modern evolutionist, at least where rejection of the King James text is concerned. The earth was immersed in water in Genesis 1-2, according to 2 Peter 3, and that comes from Ruckman. Uh, his Theological Studies, Book 16, out of Pensacola, Florida. And if you open up your Schofield Reference Bible, I'll let you kind of see this. You can kind of see I've got some highlighted here above and below. So basically up here is all notes, down here is all notes, and this little section right here is the reference, is the Scripture. So which one's more prominent on page number one, the Scripture or Schofield? Schofield is on page number one now he or page three in the Schofield reference Bible now if you start reading in verse number one It says in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and then right after that he puts this note earth made waste and empty by judgment 
So you can't help but read it because it's right there in the scripture. And he goes on to say, if you look on down at his notes, he says the first creative act refers to the dateless past and gives scope for all geologic ages. Jeremiah 4, verses 23 through 26, Isaiah 24, and uh, Isaiah 45, 18 clearly indicate that the earth had undergone a cataclysmic change as a result of a divine judgment the face of the earth bears everywhere. The marks of such a catastrophe, there are not wanting imitations which connect it with a previous testing and fall of angels. Now, Exodus chapter number 20, verse 11 says, For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the Sabbath day. Now, show me in that verse where's a gap. Where in that verse does God allow for a gap of thousands or millions of years? It's not in that verse, is it? Because God flat out says, hey, in six days, God made the heaven and the earth and what? And the sea and all that in them is and rested on the seventh, right? The purpose of dispensationalism, I think, is nothing more than just a way to prop up Zionism, to prop up you know, their teaching on end time events. It's kind of like this, when you tell a lie, you often have to tell another lie to cover for the first lie you told. Well, the problem is, many times if people start investigating, things don't add up and then you have to tell another lie and another lie until finally it, you just have so many lies You've just forgotten where you're at. You got to lie to cover that up, right? And then you got to tell another lie on top of that. We all know how that goes, that you tell a lie and it just snowballs from there on and gets worse and worse and worse. In fact, the prime example of that is dispensationalism, right? Because dispensationalism is a doctrine which each lie, it just snowballs and goes further and further down the drain because it starts off with the falsehood of Zionism, right? Starts off with this false doctrine, and when you start off with that false doctrine, it doesn't pan out, it doesn't hold water, so now you have to invent something to protect your view of the Jews. So you've got to invent the pre-trib rapture. The, the secret pre-trib rapture story and Christian Zionism, that's a two-headed monster. Monster, <laughs> yeah. it's a two-headed freak monster, okay? They come together, both of them come together because they were started by the same people. The Christian Zionists started the pre-trib rapture doctrine. And this was, the, was seed planted decades ago, but it came into full fruit That's within right. the last 30 they years. They had to create the pre-trib rapture doctrine to justify Christian Zionism. There are principally two conflicting views among Christians regarding how Jesus is going to come. You know, there are probably hundreds of different variants of those views, but there are two primary views. Let me share with you briefly what they are. The first view is that when the rapture occurs, the church will be caught up and the lost are left behind alive for seven years of tribulation. Then at the end of that seven years, Jesus comes back with the church that's been raptured and he then sets up his millennial kingdom here on earth. The other view is that the rapture takes place at the end of the time of tribulation. Now those who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, they try to say that the scripture in Matthew 24 that talks about the trumpet sounding and Jesus coming in the clouds and gathering the elect, they try to say that that's not the rapture. And their proof for that is that it takes place after the tribulation. Of course, we all know that the rapture takes place before the tribulation. Well, we, no, we don't know that because the Bible says in Matthew 24 and elsewhere that the rapture takes place after the tribulation. But because they don't believe that, they have to say that this is not the rapture. So what they say this is, is they say this is when Jesus Christ comes uh, in glory, they say, in Revelation 19, when Jesus Christ comes at the end of the, of the week, at the end of the tribulation, as they call it, and they say, you know, that's at the end of the seven years, when Jesus Christ comes on the white horse. That's what we're reading about in Matthew 24. Well, here's the problem with that. 
You will not find anything in Revelation 19 that even remotely resembles what you read in Matthew 24. So I'll suggest you do this. Take Matthew 24 and compare it to 1 Thessalonians 4, then compare it to Revelation 19 and see which one it resembles the most. Because those who believe in a pre-trib rapture, they think Matthew 24 is about Revelation 19. Those who believe in a post-trib rapture say that Re Matthew 24 is about 1 Thessalonians 4. Well, in 1 Thessalonians 4, we have a trumpet sound. In Matthew 24, we have a trumpet sound. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Christ comes in the clouds. In Matthew 24, He comes in the clouds. In 1 Thessalonians 4, we are caught up together, be with Him in the clouds. In Matthew 24, He gathers the elect unto Himself. He gathers the saved. Elect always refers to saved in the New Testament every single time. But in Revelation 19, you won't find any of these elements. In Revelation 19, there's no mention of Jesus coming in the clouds. In Revelation 19, there's no mention of a trumpet sounding. In Revelation 19, you don't see him gathering up the believers from this earth. And so there really is no similarity between Revelation 19 and Matthew 24, but there's a ton of similarity between Matthew 24 and 1 Thessalonians 4. So it's really obvious if you don't have a preconceived idea that the events in Matthew 24 mirror 1 Thessalonians 4, they do not mirror the events in Revelation 19, unless you just want to say that because you're just refusing to believe that the rapture comes after the tribulation. A man named Darby, who was the founder of the Plymouth Brethren, have you heard that church? It's called Darby's until he embraced that. And that still didn't take off, but what really made it popular was a man named Schofield. Any of you ever heard of the Schofield Bible? He incorporated Darby's interpretation of Revelation in his Bible notes and how Lindsay believed that as well as some others and popularized it with some books so that amazing thing that happened is Protestants began to believe the Jesuit interpretation of prophecy which basically says Revelation 4 when John hears a trumpet and he's caught up in vision that's the rapture and everything from Revelation 4 on happens after the church is left the rapture clearly is not in Revelation 4 that is one of the most ridiculous teachings out there, yet it is considered sound doctrine in most churches. It's in every textbook that they're going to learn about in college. It's in every book teaching about a pre-trib rapture. It's seen as just a fact in these churches, even though there are clear differences in what we see in Revelation 4 than what we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Yet, pastors constantly say things like, you know, right there's the rapture, it says, come up hither, that's a picture of the rapture, and you'll never see the church mentioned again in the rest of the book of Revelation. Now, first of all, that's just completely stupid, but yet so many people are saying it. Now, how is that? Because once again, these people are not shaping their doctrine on the Word of God and what they are studying in the Word of God. They're going off of Schofield's notes. It says right here in his notes, this call seems clearly to indicate the fulfillment of 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 17. The word church does not occur in the revelation till all is fulfilled. Well, there you have it. We have something that's completely different here in Revelation 4 than 1 Thessalonians 4, yet it is an established fact and the pre-trib churches that the rapture is in Revelation chapter 4 and they prove it by saying you don't see the church mentioned again after chapter 4. Where does that come from? It comes from Schofield's notes. They will tell us that the Bible taught an imminent rapture. They will say that Peter and Paul believed that the rapture could come at any moment. Well how could that be when Revelation teaches seven church ages? That would mean those seven church ages would have to be fulfilled before the rapture would be imminent. So in one breath they're saying Peter and Paul believed in an imminent rapture, and then in the next breath they say the Bible teaches seven church ages. Both teachings are ridiculous, and both of them completely clash with one another. Dispensationalists are deceived about the fruit of dispensationalism. They think that their fruit is good. They think that their fruit, it clarifies the Word of God, it makes it easier for the people of God. But let's see, let's just examine that fruit. First of all, look at Matthew 7, look what the Bible says. Matthew 7, and look down at verse number 15, and the Bible says in verse 15, Beware false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. 
Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringing forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringing forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not, for, bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Now listen, dispensationalism is a corrupt tree. It started with John Nelson Darby. And John Nelson Darby, by the way, wrote his own translation of the Bible. He changed the Bible. He had a lot of strange and weird beliefs. He started his own cult called the Plymouth Brethren and the exclusive Plymouth Brethren. And he believed that he got all these revelations from God that no Christian had ever gotten before. And he did not believe in the salvation that we see in the Word of God. That it's just by belief. He was an evil, wicked man. And this man has been called the father of modern dispensationalism. So if the tree is corrupt, then what kind of fruit does it have? Corrupt fruit. It cannot bring forth good fruit. So no wonder we get to our day and time and it is dispensationalism that says we're in the last church age. And it is dispensationalism that says that because we're in the church age, that this church age is the Laodicean church. And what do we see when we look around? We see the fruit of dispensationalism. A lot of lukewarm churches. A lot of churches that are doing nothing for Christ. You see, your dispensationalism, you've been deceived. It hasn't caused you to do greater works for God. It's caused you to lose your fire and your zeal for God. Because if you can't study the Word of God, if you can't understand it, then that's just throwing a, weight, a wet blanket on a fire, isn't it? Because the people of God can't understand it, and then the preachers don't understand why the people aren't excited about the things of God. Well, maybe because they can't understand it because of your stupid garbage. Because of your stupid doctrine that you've been teaching for years, all of your life, and then they sit there and wonder why they have men that come out of their church that become heretics. Men that come out of their church and they take the name Baptist off the sign. You know why? Because to that, that heretic, Baptist is not for this dispensation. Well, people say Baptist is a biblical name. It is biblical, but it's not dispensational for this age. In other words, John the Baptist and that's who the Baptist is. John the Baptist, that's where we find the Baptist in the Word of God. John the Baptist conducted his entire ministry under the law, not under grace. And as the forerunner of the king, he baptized with water repentant Jews who came confessing their sins at their baptism, and they were baptized for the remission of sins. But you know why Schofield has to create all these dispensations? Because by the time you get to Genesis chapter number 12, you're already in the fourth dispensation. I mean, think about it. There's seven dispensations is what he says. And when you get to Genesis 12, you're still in the very beginning, aren't you? And so in the very beginning, you're already at the fourth dispensation. And so from there on, you just have a couple dispensations left. Why does he do that? Why all of a sudden are you already in the fourth dispensation? You know why? He has to give the three dispensations before quickly in order to get you used to this idea of dispensationalism so that he can pull the wool over your eyes and to deceive you about something. And it's basically a system of theology that's meant to promote Zionism and a pre-trib rapture that is in no way, shape or form in the Bible. Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy father's 
and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless him that blesseth thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now how many times have we heard churches that have taken these verses and said, hey, if you're going to have the blessings of God, you need to bless the Jews. As I will bless those who bless you, and curse those who curse you. This is God's foreign policy statement for Israel that has never changed. I believe in Christian, and I believe those who bless Israel will be blessed, and those who do not will not. It says in the Bible, we need to support Israel. So that's important to you as a Christian? As a Christian. Even though it's a Jewish state? Correct. Okay. But in the end, they will see the light, and they will become Christians. The Jews in Israel will become Christians in the end? Yeah. If we back out of supporting Israel, I, as a strong Christian and believer in God, I think that his support of us will also go away. Do you know what I really appreciate about you, Pastor, so much is your support for Israel. Yes. And I rarely have met someone as committed to Israel as you. I did not know about your financial support for Israel. Jewish people. Well, one of the things that we have done as a church and we have done as a ministry is every year try to do something practical and special to bless Israel and or the Jewish people. Uh, we have brought over 20,000 Jewish people from Russia, from various nations. That's what amazed me. Yeah. I did not know that yes. part. 20,000? 20, 20,000. Uh, to Israel from Russia and various oh, nations amazing. of the world. Uh, we have given more than $30 million to Israel. If you're going to have God bless you, you better bless them. Otherwise, you're going to have the curse of God upon you. But is that what the Bible says? In Galatians chapter number 3, verse number 8, it says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, Preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So what was it that God is saying here? Is he saying, hey, you better bless the Jews. Hey, at this time, the Jews don't exist. The nation of Israel doesn't exist yet. It is singular. The is singular, and it's speaking to Abraham. Schofield clearly intentionally set out to deceive when it came to the seed of Abraham. They will constantly use that verse to prove that the land belongs to the Jews. Well, there's a problem with that because Galatians chapter 3 verse 15 makes it very clear. It says, he said, not unto seeds as of many, but as unto one, referring specifically to Jesus Christ. The seed was Jesus Christ, not the descendants of Abraham. Notice verse number 7. This is an important verse. And it says, and the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto thy what? Seed will I give this land, and there he built an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. You see, this verse right here, this is where Schofield wants to deceive you. This is why dispensationalism exists, is it exists to protect the false doctrine of Zionism. Because in this portion of scripture, he changes what the word seed means. In fact, if you were to go to, to the average preacher out there, the average independent Baptist preacher, and just read him the scripture, don't tell them anything. Just read him the scripture and ask them, who is the seed and who are they going to tell you? They'll tell you the seed is the descendants of Abraham, that it's physical Israel, and where did they get that? Because they didn't get it from the Word of God. Because that word seed, what we will see in the Word of God, is that seed is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at what he says. He says this in his notes on Genesis chapter number 12. He says, the fourth dispensation promise for Abraham and his descendants. You see where they're getting it from? It is evident that the Abrahamic covenant made a great change. They became distinctively the heirs of promise. The covenant is holy, gracious, and unconditional. The descendants of Abraham had but to abide in their own land to inherit every blessing. Now most King Baptists, they use the King James Bible. They're not getting it from those other versions. So where are they getting that from? 
they're getting it from Schofield's notes. It says, for Abraham and his descendants, it is evident that the Abrahamic covenant made a great change. So right there says Abraham and his descendants, where the King James Bible says an Abraham and his seed, Galatians 3 makes it clear that that seed was not seeds as of many, or as in descendants, but as Jesus Christ is who that seed was. Now look at Genesis chapter number 13, one chapter over, verse number 15, and the Bible says there, Genesis chapter number 13, and verse number 15, and the Bible says, For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy what? Seed. Now, there's two people that are mentioned there, right? He said, to thee and to who? Thy seed, he said. Let's continue moving on. Genesis 15, 5. And it says, and he brought him forth abroad and said, look now toward heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy, what? Seed be. You notice who the, all these promises are going to be to? They are to the seed. That is important. Let's continue moving on. Genesis chapter number 17, verse number 7, and the Bible says right there, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy, what? Seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed. So what was the covenant here? That God said, hey, to thy seed, I will always be their God. Who is Jesus to you? Oh, that's a hard question. A cousin. No. I don't know. Okay. I guess uh, um, for me it's nothing. I I think that what they want to know is why we Jews don't believe in Jesus, that he's the Messiah. You know. I don't know. I don't know. מאמינה במה שהיהדות שמה לפנינו. ישו הגיע אלפי שנים אחרי. כולם היה יהודי, אבל הלך לדת אחרת. הקים דת אחרת. מי זה ישו? כאילו, מבחינת המבט היהודית. יש גמרא על ישו, במסכת סנהדרין, שהוא היה תלמיד של תנא, אבל הוא כפר בעיקר. הוא יצא לדרך שהיא לא הדרך של היהדות. הוא האמין בזה שכבר הגיע הזמן של העולם הבא, למרות שלא הגיע הזמן של העולם הבא. Okay. משהו כזה. Okay. Okay. Uh, זה על ישו, מי זה ישו במבט ה... ג'יזוס קרייסט במבט היהודית. ישו? כן. הוא מוצרי, הוא לא קשור אלינו בכלל. אוקיי, can you maybe explain in some way why? Or why, why we don't, why Jews in general, or you, don't believe in Jesus Christ as your a, Lord and Savior, that kind of thing? It's not our tradition. We have our own tradition, which is uh, very ancient and very um, ingrained, how would you say? Um, ingrained. Ingrained, yeah. ingrained. Yeah. And part of it is not believing, <coughs> is not believing in Jesus. What was the covenant here? That God said, hey, to thy seed, I will always be their God. Now listen, if you believe that the descendants is the seed, then you know what you have to say? Then you have to say what the hyper-dispensationalists say. And this is why they say this. They say that, hey, the Jews, they're all going to be saved. You see why they pervert the scripture right later on when the Bible says, and so all Israel shall be saved. And in the Old Testament when God says, all the seed of Israel shall be justified. Hey, it's not talking about the physical seed because then all you'd have to do is you'd have to be a physical descendant. Are you kidding me? Your salvation comes down to your DNA? I'm delighted to present my latest book in defense of Israel. This book will expose the sins of the fathers and the vicious abuse of the Jewish people. In defense of Israel will shake Christian theology. It scripturally proves that the Jewish people as a whole did not reject Jesus as Messiah. It will also prove that Jesus did not come to earth to be the Messiah. It will prove that there was a Calvary conspiracy between Rome, the high priest and Herod to execute Jesus as an insurrectionist too dangerous to live. Since Jesus refused by word and deed to claim to be the Messiah, how can the Jews be blamed for rejecting what was never offered? Read it in this shocking expose in defense of Israel. Who the seed is has clearly been 
forgotten in your mainstream IFB church today. An example of someone who has no clue who the seed is, is none other than William Grady who wrote Holy Ground, The True History of the State of Israel. If you look inside his book, in the dedication, he says this book is dedicated to the Almighty Jehovah for his future bride, Israel. And then he quotes Hosea 2.19 where it says, And I will betroth thee unto me forever, yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. He says that's talking specifically about Israel, referring to a physical people. But in Hosea, you know, basically God commands Hosea to go take a whore to be his wife. And she's not faithful to him. She goes off and she has many lovers and he brings her back. And that is used as a picture to the nation of Israel. And so here's what the dispensationalist says. The dispensationalist takes Hosea chapter number two, which is quoted in Romans chapter number nine. And he takes it and says, see, God is going to bring them back unto himself. And here's what they teach. They teach that in the Old Testament, Israel was married to God the Father, and that Israel is the wife of God the Father, and the New Testament church is the bride of Jesus Christ. That they are two different brides, two different wives. Now, first of all, Jesus Christ said, there are others which are not of this fold, and them also I must bring in, and they shall be one fold, the Bible says. Ephesians chapter number two tells us that God has broken down the middle wall of partition to, to make of twain one new man, one new body, the Bible says, and tells us that we are no more foreigners or strangers, but we are citizens of the household of God and of the saints, that we are fellow citizens with them, the Bible says. Now look at what the Bible says here in Hosea chapter number 2. Look down at verse number 19. And the Bible says right there in Hosea 2, verse number 19, And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord. And then they'll sit there and say, See, Old Testament Israel, they're coming back. But let's just read the context, shall we? Look at the rest of the verse, the rest of the chapter. Verse 21, And it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and, and they shall hear the earth, and the earth shall hear the corn, and the wine, and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel, and I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy, notice this, upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. That is the direct quote right out of Romans chapter 9. So if we're going to compare this and say this here, that these are the people of God, well, why don't we take what the Bible tells us and say who the people of God are? Not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Now you can try to say that Hosea is talking about a physical people, the physical nation of Israel, all you want, but there's a huge problem with that because of the fact that Romans actually quotes Hosea. Romans 9.24 clearly says, Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And he saith also in Osi, which is Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. So Romans, quoting Hosea, makes it crystal clear that we, as Gentiles, are included. It specifically says, not of the Jews only. Remember what did Jesus Christ say? I know that ye are of your father Abraham, but ye seek to kill me. Ye are not of your father Abraham, ye are of your father the devil. Here with these dispensationalists get the idea that this is only referring to the physical nation of Israel in the future and not referring to 
a, the bride of Christ that is made up of Jew and Gentile. Where would that come from? Well, it comes from Schofield's notes. It says that Israel, that Israel is the wife of Jehovah. Now disowned, but yet to be restored, is the clear teaching of the passages. This relationship is not to be confounded with that of the church to Christ. In the mystery of the divine triunity, both are true. The New Testament speaks of the church as a virgin espoused to one husband, which should never be said of an adulterous wife restored in grace. Israel is then to be restored and for a and forgiven wife of Jehovah, the church, the virgin wife of the land. So that's it. And the real fascination, the uh, I should say obsession with American evangelical Christians is the political state of Israel. And they have replaced the cross with the Star of David. They no longer teach Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected and coming back in glory. It's all about the nation of Israel. And, and this is not Christianity. No. If, if you were unsaved today and you turned on Christian television, or you listen to Christian radio, you would think that Christianity was about getting Israel their land back. Right. And welcome back to The Watchman, only right here on TBN. Well, at Christians United for Israel, we know that God is not finished with Israel and the Jewish people by a long shot. If you take a map and look where Abraham walked, it is the length and breadth of what is today known as Israel. Israel. The issue in the Middle East is land. Who owns the land of Israel? That's what you would think Christianity is all about. That is not Christianity. And nowhere in the New Testament Bible, I'm talking about the New Testament, folks, the New Testament Bible, nowhere does it talk about that our focus is to make sure that the Zionist Jews get their land back before the end of the age. What is the focus of the New Testament? Salvation of souls, all souls, Jews, Arabs, Africans, Asians, Latinos, Caucasians. It's all about souls. Jesus Christ died on a cross. He went to the grave. He descended to the place of the dead. He rose from the grave. He ascended to heaven. He's coming back in glory. For what? Not so that the Zionists rule the world from Jerusalem, but so that he will rule the universe from New Jerusalem. That's the gospel. And it has been forgotten in this country because the gospel in America has been overthrown by Christian Zionism. Members of Temple Philadelphia in Salinas held a march this morning to celebrate Israel on its 70th anniversary. The congregation marched through the downtown area to the courthouse and back to the church, waving flags and signs in support of Israel. One of the ministers said despite the tension surrounding Israel, their demonstration is not politically motivated. It is a cancer in the body of Christ today, and it has confused the minds of people that they think that all we're supposed to do is save the land for the people in Israel who don't care about Jesus and who are persecuting the Christians in the Middle East who love Jesus. Right. And this is insanity that this is going on every day in America and hundreds of millions of dollars are being donated by Christians for Zionism. And yet there's no passion for winning souls of people who are lost and going to hell. And we have to return to the doctrine of Christ crucified, coming back in glory. It has nothing to do with land, nothing to do with land. Jesus' return is not dependent on anybody getting somebody else's land. It's all about Christ getting your soul. And we've got to get this message back on Christian television and Christian radio and in the pulpits again. Why is it such a big deal 
that who the seed is. I mean, Schofield says the seed is the descendants, but let's see who the Word of God says it is. Galatians chapter number 3, and look back down, Galatians chapter number 3 and verse number 16, and the Bible says right there, Galatians 3, 16, now to Abram, Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one. And who is that one? And it says, into thy seed, which is Christ, the Bible says. Of course I'm going to discredit Judaism if I'm a Christian. Why would I, as a Christian, believe in Judaism? I mean, do I believe in Islam? Do I believe in Hinduism? Am I a Buddhist? No, I'm a Christian. And listen to me, my friend. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And he said, there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And listen, there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that name is Jesus. No one can be saved without the name of Jesus. And listen, this whole racial thing, it's all about bloodlines. Bible says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But when we start talking about race, we are talking about bloodlines. Now listen, as a church, we are physical people here, but we are we are also people who have been born again. We are saved people. And we are not here today. We are not assembled together because of a bloodline, of a family relation. We are here because what we all have in common is a spiritual heritage, and that is Jesus Christ. Hi, this is Pastor Major with Faith Baptist Church. And so I just want to ask you a question today. Are you 100% that you are going to go to heaven, that you will have eternal life? And most people, when they answer this question, usually they'll say something to the effect of, of yes, and how they know it is that they're going to be a good person, they've done good works, they go to church, they've been baptized, and things of that nature. But what does the Bible say about that? because it's what God says that really matters. And so in the Word of God in Ephesians chapter number 2 and verses 8 and 9, the Bible says this, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so the Bible is clear there that salvation is by grace through faith, and that it's not of works, it's not of yourselves, not of the things that you do, not of the works that you do, and it says there that it is the gift of God. Now let me ask you a question. When's the last time you had to work for a gift? Because if you work for it, then it's not actually a gift, is it? And if you even had to be good in order to get a gift, then it was not a gift because a gift is something that's free that has no strings attached. And let me ask you this as well. You know, when it comes to a gift, who pays for a gift? The giver or the receiver? Well, according to the Bible, it, it is the giver that pays for a gift. The receiver just accepts it. And so if salvation is the gift of God, God is the giver, we are the receiver, then it is God who had to pay for it, which is why the Lord Jesus Christ had to pay for our salvation with his life on the cross according to the word of God. And you know, many people would say, well, I still think you can you know, be a good person and keep the law, obey the Ten Commandments and those things. But the Bible says this in Galatians chapter number 2 and verse number 16. The Bible says right there, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And so the Bible is pretty clear that no flesh will be justified. No one can be saved by the works of the law. 
Reason being is because we've all broken God's law, haven't we? We've all sinned, we've all transgressed, and the Bible makes it clear and says that if you offend the law in one point, you're guilty of the whole. Therefore, we would all be guilty because no matter how good you are, we have all sinned and we have all come short of the glory of God. Which is why the Bible says in Romans chapter number 3, verse number 10, it says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And the Bible goes on to say there as well, Romans 3, 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so the Bible is clear that every one of us have sinned and no matter how good of a person you are, doesn't matter if you're the best person that's walked on the face of the planet, you have sinned and therefore come short of the glory of God. Meaning that you cannot save yourself, you cannot get yourself to heaven, that it's only by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that we can be saved. But there is something that you do earn for your sin and do you know what that is? Well according to the Bible, the Bible says in Romans chapter number six, Six and verse number 23 it says for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord and so right there the Bible says for the wages of sin is death now a wage is something that you earn it's a payment and so what we earn or the payment for our sin is death now is that just talking about physical death because we all know that someday we're going to die, right? Someday we're, our, we're all going to get old or we're going to get disease and we're going to pass away. But is that just talking about physical death? And you know most people understand that it's talking about something else but they're not quite sure about what it's talking about. But the Bible tells us this in Revelation chapter number 21 in verse number 8. The Bible says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And so that lake that burns with fire and brimstone, that is the second death. That's the payment for our sins. And because that's the payment for our sins, that's what Jesus Christ had to do when he died on that cross, the Bible teaches that his soul went to hell for three days and three nights and then he was raised from the grave. He did that to pay our payment for us and it would be impossible for us to pay that payment. You see, the payment is not your good works. It's not living a good life or being a good person. The payment for our sins was to go to hell. And one day, if you don't accept the Lord Jesus Christ and what He's paid for you, then you will have to go to the lake of fire for an eternity, according to the Bible. And you may say, well, I think I'm a pretty good person. I don't deserve to go to hell. I think I've done a pretty good life. But the Bible says this, it says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters, and you may not be one of those, <clears throat> but the Bible says, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Now let me ask you a question. If I were going to call you a murderer, how many times would you have to commit murder in order to be called a murderer? And the answer is just one time, right? And so if I were going to call you a liar, how many times would you have to tell a lie in order to be called a liar? Well, just one time. And every one of us, and no matter how good you have lived your life, have told lies in our lifetime. Therefore, we are all sinners, and the Bible makes it plain that we deserve to go to the lake of fire and that we could never pay for our sins ourselves. And so Jesus had to pay that payment for us, which is why the Bible said, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now Jesus Christ was able to pay that payment because he wasn't like you and I. And when he paid that payment, did he pay for some people or all people? And the answer is obviously all people. And how about this, did he pay for some sin or all sin? And let me ask you a question. If you said he paid for all sin, well let me ask you this, how about this? What if you committed suicide? Would you still be able to go to heaven? Well, the Bible makes it plain, and if we're going to say that he paid for all sin, then suicide would be included in all. 
And the Bible does say that we are cleansed from all our sin. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 7, at the end of the, the verse there, it says, And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. And so there, that word all, it means all. That includes suicide. And so even if you committed suicide, you would still go to heaven because all means all my past, present, and future sins. And anything I could ever do in the future has been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus could pay that payment for us because he wasn't like you and I. And the Bible says he was tempted in all points like as we, yet without sin. Now let me ask you another question. Was Jesus Christ God? Because many people are confused on their subject or they're not quite sure whether Jesus Christ was God or not. Many people will say, well, no, he was not God. But let me ask you this. Let's just think logically, shall we? The Bible said, the verse we saw earlier, Romans 3.23, said, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So that's talking about all mankind. So if Jesus were just a normal human being, then Jesus would have had sin, just like you and I, and therefore would not have been able to pay for our sins. He would have had to pay for his own. So according to what we will see in the Bible, the Bible makes it plain that Jesus Christ actually was God manifest in the flesh. I'll give you one quick verse on that. The Bible says in Matthew chapter number 21, Oh, I'm sorry, Matthew 1, verse 21 says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, So who's speaking it? Well, it says it's spoken of the Lord, so that's God there that's speaking it. Verse 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And so it, did you catch what it said there? The Bible says there, one of the names that God gave Jesus was Emmanuel. That name meant God with us. So God the Father called Jesus God. And so right there, it's pretty plain that Jesus Christ is God according to the word of God. And there are many other scriptures that are pretty clear that show us that Jesus was God. For example, in Hebrews chapter number one and verse number eight, uh, you have God the Father actually calling the Son God. In fact, it says there, Hebrews 1, eight, but unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness is a scepter of thy kingdom. And so right there, you again have God the Father calling the Son, God. And so the Bible is clear that Jesus Christ is God and that's how he was able to pay for our sins because he was God manifest in the flesh and therefore he could be perfect and have no sin and thereby pay for our sins and become the substitute for us and what we deserve. Now, let me ask you a question. Let's say Jesus Christ were to give you eternal life today and you had eternal life today. Is there anything you could do to lose that salvation? I mean, if you went out, committed murder, committed suicide, is there anything that you could do to lose that salvation? And some people would say, well, yeah, you could, uh, you could become a pretty bad person and lose that salvation. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says in John chapter number 10 and verse number 28, it says, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. So right there, the Bible is pretty clear. Jesus Christ told us three different ways in that one verse that you cannot lose your salvation. First of all, let me ask you, what does the word eternal mean? And it means forever, right? And if it means forever, let me ask you this, if you could lose your salvation, was it forever? You see, the word eternal itself means that you cannot lose your salvation. Then he goes on to say, and they shall never perish. Now that sounds like you can't lose your salvation when he says, you will never perish. Then he says, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now let me ask you a question. Are you of mankind? Are you a human being? And the answer is yes. And so according to the Bible, can you pluck yourself out of his hand? And again, the Bible is making it clear that, hey, 
neither can any man pluck himself out of his hand. So that means that no one can. So three different ways there, Jesus Christ told us you can't lose your salvation. And there are many other scriptures in the Bible that confirm this. For example, the Bible says that we are saved according to his mercy. Now, if you were to look up in the book of Psalms, I believe it's chapter 136, the entire chapter is filled with one phrase throughout that entire chapter over and over and over again. And that phrase is this, that the mercy of the Lord endureth forever. And so if we're saved according to his mercy, and his mercy endureth forever, that means you can never lose your salvation. So then the last question we have is, is what does it take in order for you to get saved? I mean, how do you get salvation in the first place? Well, Jesus Christ answered that as well in John chapter number three and verse number 36, Jesus Christ said this, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And so what one thing in that verse did Jesus Christ say you had to do in order to be saved? And Jesus Christ said that he that believeth on the Son. So that's the one thing that Jesus Christ said. Now what does that word believe mean? Well that word, let me give you an example. Let's say I were gonna ask you to do me a favor and, and I said, I, and I believe in you. Well what am I saying? I'm saying that I trust in you. I'm putting my trust in you. I'm believing on you. And I'm not trusting myself to get it done. I'm trusting you to get it done. And so when, it, when Jesus Christ says, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, what he's saying is that you recognize that there's nothing you can do to save yourself and that you're only trusting him and what he did in order to be saved. And to show you that he emphasizes this, he goes on to say in verse 15, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so over and over and over again, Jesus Christ says that you just must simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you believe that, let me ask you a question here today. Do you believe that Jesus Christ, that salvation is just simply by belief or is it by your works? Because if it's by your works, by being a good person, and you're not trusting your, uh, trusting Christ, you're trusting yourself and what you've done. And you may say, well, it's faith plus works. Well, the Bible says in Romans 11:6 6, that if it's of grace, it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. And so the Bible makes it plain that it's either of grace or it's of works. Because if it's of grace, grace is God giving you what you don't deserve, what you have not paid for, what you have not earned. And if it's of works, then it's something you have to work for, you have to earn. And we know it's by grace because the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. Now, if you believe these things, if you believe that salvation is eternal, that you can never lose it, if you believe that Jesus Christ is God, if you believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again and paid for your sins, and if you believe it's only by believing in him, then all you have to do is place your trust in him. And here's how you do that. The Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And so the Bible makes it plain there that all you must do is confess the Lord Jesus Christ. Not confess your sins, not confess your inadequacies, but you confess Jesus Christ and what he did that he died and arose from the grave and you believe that and the bible says thou shalt be saved and you say well how do i do that well the bible says in verse number 13 if you believe these things it says for whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved and so what that is saying is that if you believe these things you simply need to call out to god and tell him that you believe these things now you may say well i prayed before in the past but here's the thing if you misunderstood in the past and you were not believing correctly in the past, then you could not truly call on God for salvation. Because the Bible says in the very next verse, in verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? 
So the Bible makes it clear that you could not actually call on him if you have not truly believed. The belief must come first and then you can call on him and ask him for salvation. So why don't you just do that here today? Why don't you just call upon the Lord Jesus Christ and ask him for salvation and ask him to save you? And listen, it doesn't have to be some exact prayer. You just pray to God and ask him to save you, ask him to forgive you. You tell him that, that you believe in his son Jesus Christ, that you're not trusting anything other than his son, and that you believe that his son died and rose again, and you pray in the Lord Jesus Christ's name, and the Bible says, thou shalt be saved. So why don't you do that today? And if you're still confused, if you still don't understand these things, come by our church and visit with us. We'd love to sit down and explain more of the Word of God to you. Come visit us at Faith Baptist Church. God bless.